going to give a talk called Kubernetes at Comcast, uh, really just sharing our experiences getting Kubernetes deployed um, into production, what it took to get that done, and, and kind of how we, how we managed to, to do it. I'm going to try to breeze through this because uh, there's a lot of detail in here and, and not a lot of time, and I'd like to leave some time for, for questions at the end. Uh, so I'll start with, with a, a quick introduction to, to myself. Um, I'm a software engineer. Uh, my role is really to empower other teams to launch their products and services on time. I've been doing that uh, with Comcast for about four years as a part of the Viper group. Uh, and what Viper does is IP video infrastructure, um, b basically taking the, the uh, applications and, and like the, the core products that make up Comcast's service offerings, linear video, um, uh, video on demand and cloud DVR, and implementing those in software and serving them um, as IP video services. Um, and, and IP video is, is fundamentally different from the way that cable is traditionally delivered in the sense that um, it's a, a unicast transmission where um, we only deliver the video that a subscriber is watching uh, as opposed to delivering every channel to every subscriber all the time. So there's, there's a lot of buy-in for this project um, and there's, there's kind of a lot of opportunity in the event that, that we succeed. Um, so I'm really going to be telling the story about how we used Kubernetes um, to develop and deploy a, a cloud DVR um, project. So cloud DVR. Um, some of you guys might have a DVR. Uh, cloud DVR is DVR in the cloud. Um, we have a, a legal requirement to store a unique copy for every user. So when, when one user hits record and another hits record, uh, we, have to, we have to store two copies of that video. And that actually gives us some really interesting technical uh, requirements. We have to commit seven terabits a second of data to disk. And when we're playing stuff back, we have to play each subscriber's copy back, um, unique copy. So we don't get to, to leverage any of the caching strategies, like a CDN, to deliver content to our subscribers for this, because each subscriber has to get a unique set or slice of, of bits. So we, we egress 300 gigabits a second. Um, our database that backs this service needs to support a million writes a second. Um, and, to, and to make this especially crazy, uh, we had to deploy this to, um, we, you know, we're, we're deploying this to 10 plus data centers. Um, so we created an architecture that we thought would work uh, and, and we sold it. Um, this architecture is the most complex architecture that Viper had deployed at the time. Or, or designed at the time. We have six components in here that would be deployed into Kubernetes, plus some back office components, um, and five external dependencies, things that interact with the system um, in order to, to store content, uh, store metadata, and, and, and provide, um, provide content to the, to the Cloud DVR system. Um, this being our most complex um, architecture, we knew we were gonna have a hard time with it. Um, and the reason for that is that our existing deployment processes weren't so great. We had um, a, a virtualization layer. We had, we had VMware um, in production. Uh, that under cloud um, VMware in all of these different data centers, was, was, data centers was experiencing configuration drift. So everywhere that we had deployed it, we were running a different version. As our cloud team would, would roll a new point release of VMware out, by the time they made it through the entire infrastructure, we were already uh, se several releases behind. Um, existing projects required um, a full-time release management because our, our applications have this matrix of compatibility, all of these different services, what's running in one, one market versus another, um, and, and how do we manage that? Um, and adding more components and creating a more complex architecture means that, that you know, we would have to double down on that existing people process and, and, and really like invest in, in uh, and something that we didn't want to invest in. Um, provisioning new VMs, getting new capacity was a ticket-based system, um, and we didn't have a way to transition from the lab to production. Um, developers would, would provision a VM in the lab and they would just run new versions of their application on it, and, and when it came time to go to production, we'd just throw the app over the wall. Um, here you go, figure it out. Um, we got the documentation on the wiki, good luck. Uh, so, so all of this kind of left us with, uh, with low confidence. You know, the existing infrastructure, the existing deployment model wasn't successful. Um, so, so we had to study to, to find a new, a new model. Um, these are our high-level requirements. 
Um, and, and these are you know, pretty simple, I think. Uh, manageable deployments, lab production parity, uh, managed risk. You know, these are real products with real customers. When we roll this stuff out, it's not like we're, we're a, a scrappy startup who's slowly ramping up the customers and can solve these problems. Um, it, over time, like, we, have to, we roll these things out to a large existing customer base. And, and because of that, it has to work, and it has to work right away. Um, and ultimately, we want faster release cycles. So we kind of had two options here. We could scale up our existing people processes, or we could find something new. Um, and, and there were a lot of new options at the time. This was about a year ago, a year and a half ago. You know, we had Mesos, Docker Swarm, um, some sort of Frankenstein's monster of different HashiCorp utilities, um, all like tied together into something that works. And then there was Kubernetes, which had just hit uh, 1.0. Um, and Kubernetes gives us containers and encapsulation. Um, and Kubernetes provides containers at scale. Um, really like declarative deployments. I can define my deployment. I can run it on, on kube local or minikube, something that actually didn't exist um, when we started this. And then I can use that same deployment when I go to production or into the lab. Uh, things like service discovery are a big deal for us um, because running multiple sets of load balancers means that any troubleshooting exercise you know, requires an investigation into is it the load balancer or the component or the next load balancer um, in the chain. Um, and then you look, looking towards the future, uh, Kubernetes is very promising with respect to providing multi-tenancy. Um, and if we used it correctly, it wouldn't necessarily lock us in. And that was a big selling point, is we didn't have to architect and design our applications and containers with Kubernetes specifically in mind. We could design a 12-factor app, dump it in a container, um, run it in Kubernetes, and if it worked, that's great, and if it didn't, we could, we could scramble. We could go back to the drawing board um, and, and figure something out. So, we had to do a lot of things. Um, and, and, and these are them. They're, because we knew that we were deploying to, to 10 or more facilities, you know, there's shortcuts that, that we couldn't permit ourselves to, to take. Um, we had to get that provisioning tier for our undercloud, for Kubernetes and all of its associated services, right? We had to answer the question of load balancing um, very, very early on, um, and we had to solve monitoring and log aggregation. These things needed to be centralized because you know, as we deploy to all of these different facilities, we don't want to have to hire uh, a team to operate every single deployment. We wanted to be able to, to have one team that understood the applications, use one single pane of glass to actually um, manage and operate these things. Um, things like Docker needed to work. Um, and that's actually been a challenge for us, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, a little bit later. And one of the toughest things that, that we've had to do is, is just educate users about best practices and, and really establish um, like a dialogue with the teams that want to use Kubernetes and want to use all of these brand new and advanced features about what works in our infrastructure um, and, and what doesn't and, and why and when we'll be changing our minds about that. Um, so with respect to our deployment automation and getting Kubernetes out there, you know, Kubernetes is great because it solves configuration drift for applications. I declare what I'm going to have, and, and it just runs in Kubernetes. And I can reuse that declaration in, in different Kubernetes clusters. Uh, but we had to solve that for Kubernetes itself and getting that uh, deployed. And, and we kind of had some principles with respect to that. Like we wanted it to be a repeatable process and error-free and instrumented. Um, and it needs to be something that's distributed because we're deploying it to many, many locations. And, and when I say instrumented, um, I'm going to kind of roll back and, and touch on that. What I really mean is that as we're, as we're rolling out changes to our infrastructure, we need to be able to, to stop and check along the way and ensure that as a result of rolling out these changes, we're not um, introducing uh, new problems. We're not inadvertently taking down our, our cluster, um, which is actually something that we've seen with, with config management like Puppet. Um, where, you, where you, you roll out a change and it kind of happens all at once and now you're in a lot of trouble. Um, so, you know, we had some goals. We, we wanted Git to be our source of truth. Um, and, and we wanted, we really wanted for our, our deployments and our upgrades to follow the same process. So, so no like, you know, yum install or yum update uh, type of thing happening. We, we wanted to use the exact same process for um, deploying a net new server as we were using for upgrading um, an existing server. 
um, keeping in mind that we were deploying this onto, onto bare metal machines in our own data centers. Now, we also needed to support other applications, things that exist outside of the context um, of Kubernetes entirely, because uh, we're deploying a much larger application that in entails storage, object storage, databases, things like that. Um, and, and we kind of wanted to think about, well, how do we, how do we manage this change over time as well? Um, you know, we have, we have a lot of facilities, but these applications that we deploy are going to exist for a long time. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to get a demo running um, and say, yeah, this is good enough. Let's roll out to production. But, but figuring out how to, how to manage that long term and ensure that a year and a half from now, we're not three point releases behind um, the, the, the uh, main line of Kubernetes uh, is important to us. Um, so, you know, we, we had this goal, let's get an immutable, immutable infrastructure, let's, let's declare what we have, um, let's use these technologies like DHCP and iPixie um, that let us just reboot a server to rebuild a site. And then we can roll a set of reboots um, across our Kubernetes cluster. Um, this, this system, uh, and then on top of that, we have Fleet that's in the mix. And Fleet um, runs all of the Kubernetes services on top of that. Uh, we, we designed the system um, specifically with, rec with respect to Fleet and the, and the um, DHCP and iPixie pieces to restrict possible variations of software um, rather than, than enable um, any sort of arbitrary individual um, application component like Kubernetes or our log aggregator or a monitoring system to be updated independently and deployed to a site. You know, we treated the entire set of configurations for our undercloud as a, as a deployable entity and we roll that out to the lab and then our other labs and then into production. Um, and this is something that reduces errors. Um, so outcomes for, for what we did here. Um, the, the systems that we, that we built have successfully deployed 1,000 physical servers um, in production today. Um, capacity augmentation for Kubernetes is fully automated. In, in fact, when um, we were first trialing the system, our deployment engineering teams racked and stacked uh, 15 additional servers, and they didn't tell us about it. And we found them in the Kubernetes API when we were wondering um, why, why we had additional capacity, um, which was a, a good get. Um, the issues with this model, it's, it's fleet is, is not a great uh, way to deploy software. Um, it's an all or nothing approach. We can't just roll a, a change through that cluster and, and, or, or through, through a cluster. We have to turn a service off and turn a new one back on. Um, and vendor products are challenging to integrate. When you buy a service or a system from a vendor, um, it's tough to, to provide them this requirement that, oh, we have to, uh, you, you need to allow us to instrument uh, an update of your software through, through a variety of, or, or through a series of reboots. Um, vendors don't really like that. Um, and we're working on a, a version two of this that we intend to open source. So another challenge that we had to uh, overcome was load balancing. I just came from a, a pretty good talk on ingress. Um, ingress didn't exist, and we had um, some pretty egregious bandwidth requirements. Um, we couldn't just deploy a couple of VMs with HA proxy and be done with it. We needed something that would scale across the entire cluster um, and let us emit a, a, uh, a lot of data. Um, our requirements are really scale, reliability, no VMs, and having some sort of failure semantics. Um, in the event that, that a master fails over. If you guys haven't heard of IPVS or used it, um, it's, a, it's a really great, um, really great tool to have in your, in your toolbox. Um, briefly, how it works, um, you have a, an IPVS master. Um, this is a component that, that publishes a, a VIP on its, on its um, public interface to the router. All of your inbound traffic comes to this master. It routes traffic to the back end, uh, which has an anycast address, and that anycast address, and that back end replies directly to the client. So you end up with um, ingress bandwidth um, equal to you know, whatever the throughput is on that master node, and egress equal to whatever the sum is of all of the throughput on all of your backends. Um, to make this work in Kubernetes, we couldn't just deploy IPVS. We wanted to make it really easy for developers to add a, a new load balancer um, and to do that quickly and to know what we had configured in IPVS. So we created a tool um, that uses the uh, config maps uh, to store a representation of, of what VIPs were assigned to what, what IPVS services. Um, so our master would get the config map, it would get the nodes, 
and it would configure um, IPvS ADM uh, with all of the rules that were necessary in order to load balance traffic to all of those different backends. And then on the backend side, we would get the config map, which would have a VIP and a port and a service and a namespace, and it would take that data and it would use it to write IP tables rules um, in, the, in the NAT table um, that would route packets that were inbound on a VIP to a specific Kubernetes service. Um, so a very high performance, low level uh, load balancer um, that, that actually works. And, and it works pretty well. Uh, changes are applied within five seconds if we make a change to this config map and we built a UI that lets developers just provision uh, any VIP that they want or any load balancer that they want um, just at the, at the click of a mouse, which is um, a real serious change from, from where it used to be. Um, the, the drawbacks of this are, are that it is limited to a single broadcast domain. That, that model of, um, of replying directly to a client um, requires that all of the nodes are layered to adjacent. Um, so, so currently we're limited to um, like 255 nodes, but we have, we have plans to, um, to scale that out even further, potentially by using BGP or by using some of the, um, the networking technologies that are, that are featured out in the, uh, in the hallway. So like the last thing that we really needed to do to make Kubernetes useful for our developers um, was logs and monitoring. Um, and, and this kind of ties into, into like bringing a DevOps model into an, an enterprise team too. Uh, the dev team that was developing this Cloud DVR application uh, didn't have operational experience. Um, you know, we, we've deployed some applications, but we throw those apps over the wall and that was it. And this development team was very new. Um, within Comcast Viper, uh, no team had ever instrumented an app with uh, any sort of metrics um, no StatsD, no Prometheus, no nothing. Um, you know, we'd emit logs and then the ops team would use uh, those logs to, to perform aggregations and guess at what the, at what the applications were actually doing. Um, and log aggregation was, was very foreign to developers. Um, and, and we kind of had this, this principle when we, when we came into this, which is that um, when it comes to designing something that developers are gonna consume, that you want people to use. Uh, you need to provide immediate value, and you need to, to demand a minimum amount of instrumentation. All of the, the weird monitoring and logging efforts that, have, that, have, that I've seen kind of come through over the years um, have, have failed because they, they impose these onerous restrictions on developers. Um, so any, any system that we introduce, um, in order to get developers to use Kubernetes and use these systems, you know, we, we really had to deliver immediate value uh, because new tooling requires a cultural shift um, and a lot of indoctrination, uh, which you might not have time to do if you're just struggling to get Kubernetes running. Um, so some other high-level goals, you know, we wanted to reuse existing implementations. Um, and we needed, we needed to, to support, you know, deployment to multiple data centers um, if, and, and to get that single pane of glass. Like if we have 20 places that we need to look for monitoring data, we need 20 people to operate that product. Um, so, so two approaches. Uh, for logs, we reused existing um, services. So our, our containers running in Docker um, on a Kubernetes node, that's what this big box is. Um, they write their logs to standard out um, using Docker's JSON log driver. We initially tried turning that off. We wanted to use um, journal control or, or one of like the direct logging drivers. Um, but when we did that, we broke uh, Kube Control's ability to get logs from the Kubernetes API, which developers were relying on. Um, and, and breaking that functionality was, was less important, um, or, or rather more important than having like a sane uh, deployment model for your, for your logging. Um, so, so we write our JSON logs to disk, and then we have a log shipper, which was Heka, now is something else. Um, and that thing reads all the logs off a disk, reads our journal control logs, reads all of this stuff, and ships it off to a very expensive uh, logging service that some of you may have used. Um, right, and, and like one of the keys to this is that we're not asking developers to, um, to ship their logs to a TCP port. It's write your logs to standard out, write your container 12 factor, and we'll figure the rest out for you. Um, and I think that works, that model works really well at, at getting people to adopt something new um, like Kubernetes. 
Now, monitoring is a little bit different. For monitoring, we replaced the existing solution because the existing solution doesn't have anything in place. Like what we're using to monitor now in Comcast doesn't have a, a good mechanism for monitoring containers. Um, you can do buddy containers, which, which I strongly disagree with. Um, you can run multiple processes in a container, but, but you know, ideally, we want a system that doesn't require instrumentation. So we found this monitoring tool um, that just like does some clever stuff with system calls um, <laughs> and ships them off to a single pane of glass. Uh, and that, that actually worked really great for us. Um, worth mentioning too that when we started the project, Prometheus uh, I don't think existed in a, in a usable form. Um, and I'm still a little bit skeptical about that. So, you know, was, was this a success? Kind of. Um, our teams were emitting hundreds of gigabytes of logs per day per site. Like, we, we gave them log aggregation, we gave it to them in the labs, and then they're like, oh, this stuff's free. Um, let's ship all of our logs. Let's, let's emit twice as many logs as we need. Um, and they did it. Um, but largely a success. Um, it, you know, one, one kind of lesson that we've learned here as we've gone into production with this app is that there isn't really a replacement for instrumenting an app. Um, to emit that internally measured telemetry. What is my application doing as measured by my application and emitting that directly? Um, so let's talk about some problems that we ran into. We ran into problems with everything. Um, Kubernetes. Kubernetes is great, um, but we did run into, into three kind of serious issues. Uh, very early on, um, we had the user space load balancer in, in place. Um, and that was the default service load balancer for Kubernetes. Our very first load test knocked that over. Um, it, was a, it was a single process load balancer, and you couldn't send more than five gigabits a second of traffic um, into a single service. Fortunately, the IP tables load balancer is exceptionally performant. Um, so that was, that was a, a freebie. Um, pod density limitations, um, one of the, the kind of gotchas, and this is more of a documentation gotcha, uh, which the opening keynote touched on, um, is that Kubernetes supports only 110 pods per node, um, which is actually quite low um, when, you, when, you, when you consider how you might want to use containers. Like, well, why not just run one container per, per uh, like logical unit, like one, pertainer, one container per channel, um, which is like a great model to, to, to use to deploy an application that deals with video and deals with channels where we might have 1,500 channels in a market. But that means that we have to scale our clusters out um, and that, that extra 15 nodes that I, that I talked about earlier, like we bought those because of pod density limitations. Um, and the last thing that we, that we run into, um, or we ran into, well, had to do with NAT um, hairpin mode. So a, a pod, if it sends a request to its own, its own host on a node port um, to another, pod, another container that's running on that node, the packet would just get lost. Um, it would hang, and, and there's actually a configuration parameter um, in the kube proxy that needs to be set uh, in order to support that sort of traffic. You say, well, why would you do that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't have a note on that. Uh, but, but it's one of the things that, um, that you, you might do if you're sending, sending requests into a, into a load balancer. Um, other problems we ran into um, pertaining to Docker. Uh, most of the issues that we've run into are, are issues with Docker. Um, and it's something that we see, these are all, I think all three of these are race conditions. Yeah. Um, we, we see race conditions all the time when you start using containers um, at, at scale, when, you're, when you're, you're churning pods very quickly um, on every single node in your cluster, you're going to get some strange errors. So this first one, this, this container doesn't exist, is a race condition where calling Docker stop at the same time as your container process dies triggers um, triggers this, this weird error where Docker doesn't think the container exists, but it actually does. And the only way to fix this, oh, and Kubernetes thinks that the pod is just terminating. So your pod gets stuck in a terminating state. The only way to fix this is to restart the Docker daemon on the node. And this happens when, um, whenever we do a deployment, because Kubernetes being something that will restart our containers if they go down, um, that's, a really, that's a really powerful like, semantic for designing uh, a system, because if something goes wrong in my container, like my pod can just commit suicide and Kubernetes will recreate it, um, which our developers did. Um, but then every time they did a deployment, they would hose uh, a Kubernetes cluster, and we would have to go in and, and restart Docker across the board. Um, the second issue, uh, Docker attach hanging containers. 
This was um, an issue triggered by our use of HECA. So HECA used Docker Attach to read the log data coming off of standard out. And if HECA couldn't keep up, or if that process stopped, um, the standard out pipe would fill, and the program that's running in your container, it would hard lock. Um, it would basically be stuck on a, on a system call to write to the standard out file descriptor, and you would have no way of determining what was happening short of going onto the node and, and futzing around with, uh, with pprof. Um, so that, that's an issue that we ended up resolving uh, by removing HECA from the critical path. Um, we didn't have time to like, evaluate and deploy FluentD, so we wrote a little 500 line um, a program that, that basically gets a list of all of the containers from the Docker API and then reads the files directly off a disk. Um, and that works for now. Um, the third piece here is a race condition with the Docker bridge. Um, essentially, this was a bad interaction between CoreOS's network D um, and Docker. In that ticket, Docker says, oh, this is a CoreOS issue, not a bug. Um, <laughs> and there's no defensive programming to check to see if the, um, you know, is that, is that device up, this network device up before we add it? Um, essentially, uh, what would happen is you would, network D would be creating this VETH device and then Docker would add it to the Docker Zero bridge. But if that VETH device wasn't created in time, um, that add to the bridge would fail and you'd be done. Um, so essentially your containers would exist, but there'd be no network bridge, there'd be no networking. Um, and Kubernetes would think that the containers were healthy. So you, know, you had, to, had to figure it out yourself. Um, we remediated that with code written in-house, similar to the logging thing. It reads a list of containers from the Docker API and then checks to see, you know, is this, is this container's VETH device in the bridge? Um, so, so three fun problems there. The, the other thing, and I think this is the last, uh, the last sort of issue that we ran into, was actually a kernel bug. Um, so this is a flame graph of, of where our, our CPU time is going. Um, we had a bug that, that essentially locked um, 40 cores on a node at 100% um, in KSoft IRQD. So it's an interrupt request is consuming 100% of 40 cores on a system whenever more than 20 connections were moving traffic. This locked our, um, our, our network throughput to one gigabit a second. It turns out that this was related to interrupts um, being processed on all cores instead of on the core that was, that was responsible for uh, the packet, and we, and we got a, a good workaround for this, uh, essentially reducing the number of receive queues um, from 40 uh, down to, to you know, whatever, however many physical cores there are on a single socket. Um, but that was, that was a pretty serious crisis, and if we hadn't resolved that, um, we, we probably would have had to abandon um, Kubernetes, or maybe just deploy it onto CentOS 6. So, so did we succeed? Um, uh, mostly. So this architecture, which is the, the current architecture minus a bunch of back office systems, um, is running in four production environments on Kubernetes. Um, those environments are deployed automatically to bare metal servers. And the development team um, for this cloud recorder is deploying on a weekly cadence. Um, and that's in contrast to uh, the monthly cadence or the quarterly cadence that a lot of the other products that we deploy uh, currently have. Um, so how did we succeed at this? Um, it, it really came down to you know, several things. First, first, I think it's the team. Um, we, we assembled a cross-functional team. Uh, we co-located that team with the developers. So the team that was responsible for the Kubernetes infrastructure was sitting in the same room as the developers who were writing the application that was going to run on this infrastructure. Um, and when the developers ran into problems, they could talk to us and, and, and we could push back if we needed to. Um, but, but really, it, it came down to the team. It, it, was, it was the right combination of, of software engineers, um, systems engineers, network engineers, people who understood every single layer of abstraction in the stack so that when we did run into these show-stopping issues, we could, as a group, um, investigate, troubleshoot them successfully. And that the solutions that we did develop, um, you know, having, having all of those various viewpoints really ensured that um, that our solutions were suitable for, for a broader audience. Um, you know, when I, when I say careful technology choices up here, um, you know, we, we made a deliberate choice, like we're gonna use Kubernetes, we're gonna use Docker, um, and we're gonna commit to it. So all of those Docker bugs, we could have said, you know what, let's go off and try Rocket or something else. 
um, and, and see, see if they fix our problems. Um, but but I, I, I really think that committing to a technical decision, understanding the stack, um, communicating that to, to your development teams and to everybody else that's involved um, was crucial to, um, to, for something like this to be a success. Because it's, it's really easy just to, to bounce around different technologies that are available, and there's so many of them. Um, but it's hard to make those work for you and make them work at scale. Uh, we also took a very conservative approach to using features within the stack. Um, even if Ingress had existed when we started as a beta feature, we wouldn't use it. Um, and, and that's just because you know, we, we, we want to be sure that um, the features that we use, every additional feature that we use has a cost. Uh, we have to understand how to use it. Um, we have to support it. And if there are problems in it, we have to understand why those problems are occurring. Um, and, and attempt to fix them. So the fewer, the fewer features that we use, the better. Um, things like SkyDNS and Cube to Sky, we don't use them. Um, and the reason for that is that that adds an additional layer of abstraction that makes it difficult to understand what our applications are doing. Um, and I think that's it for success factors. We attempted a DevOps, um, and we're still doing that. Um, so stumbling blocks, problems that we had along the way. Um, they're mostly technological. They're, they're you know, issues with all of the technology, and we, we kind of talked about them. Um, but they're, they're problems that we can solve if we, if we put our minds to it and really understand what's going on. Um, you know, one of the big unsolved problems, I think, and this is something that I see as, as more teams within Viper um, attempt to use or want to use the stack, is that state management is, is an issue. Um, where do we store data? Where do we store the volumes that your database is running on? Um, do we need to run something that's attached, or can we run a distributed file system? I, I don't think there are great solutions to that right now. Um, and, and especially when you're running on-premise, on you know, you can't just use S3. You need to deploy an object storage system alongside your Kubernetes. Um, and, and that's pretty hard. So things that we need to do better. Uh, DevOps is hard, and it's, it's really hard in a... Um, in an organization like as big as Comcast, where you have a lot of these kind of entrenched teams and business processes, like Conway's Law is, is this idea, right, that our, um, our application architectures mirror the structure of our organization. Uh, and that's something that actually happens. That's something that I've witnessed. And, and the DevOps model and declarative infrastructure and having developers do deployments, like that kind of flies in the face of that. Um, so it's, it's really hard to get people to think in those mindsets and to, and to take on these problems and this responsibility, especially when it's things that, um, that other teams have historically been responsible for. Um, responsibility for infrastructure. Um, that, I think that's one of the toughest things uh, because the, the, I think the compulsion is when, when something is going wrong with your application, you look at the layer of abstraction below you and you blame that. And at some point, the buck has to stop. And if your team owns the infrastructure, that's where the buck stops, because you don't have anything else to blame. Um, cosmic rays, no. Like, it's the infrastructure's responsibility to, to clear its name and, and push responsibility uh, back up the chain um, when things go wrong. Um, I think the last piece on here, saying no, um, is, is really tough. You know, when, when development teams come to me and say, hey, I need DNS, and I need it yesterday, or else my project's going to fail. Um, a plague of locusts is going to come over the land, um, and, and everything's just going to crash and burn, and we'll all get fired. Like, I have to say no to that, because uh, you know, we, we, we made that decision. And, and if, we, if we renege on that um, and, and adopt these additional features, there's a cost to that, a cost to supporting it. Um, and, and if things go wrong, you know, a cost to the whole organization. Uh, so we're very careful about that, um, and that it's not easy to, to do that day in and day out. So where we're going, um, you know, six products within Viper, um, in addition to the one that I showed you, are, are, have either been developed for Kubernetes or migrated to it. Um, the immutable deployment model is something that we're rolling out. Um, we're looking to the future towards dealing with multi-tenancy, um, kind of building a crappy version of AWS uh, within Comcast. Um, doing stuff with IPv6 and hybrid six to four clusters, and then scaling out um, beyond 200 nodes. Um, that's, that's really where we're headed with that. Um, and, and I'm very excited for, uh, for our future. And that's it. All right, any questions? Right. 
So the question was, how did you deal with state um, in the cloud since you were running on bare metal? So for this pilot application, um, be, being in cloud DVR and having these, these um, excessive throughput requirements, you know, we manage state externally. We're running an in-memory distributed database specific to this application, and we're running an object storage um, that, that gets deployed alongside it. Most of the 1,000 servers that we've deployed are um, actually pertaining to that. Are we handling PKI for nodes? Yeah. I don't know what PKI is. Oh, we're not. <laughs> so the question was, what's driving IPv6? Um, as we, so a lot of things. There's a big push within the company um, to, to move towards IPv6. Um, and I think that long-term communication with external clients um, set-top boxes and things like that within the Comcast network um, are intended to be IPv6 only. Uh, there are also some pretty cool IPv6 technologies like segment routing and, and uh, I think Anycast IPs, I don't think I'm getting the name right, um, that, that our architecture astronauts are, have in mind. So the question was, uh, what's, what's the interface for our developers? Um, so our developers are using an in-house developed CI-CD pipeline um, that leverages Concourse um, and a tool that, that we wrote that takes um, a couple of state files and converts them into all of the Kubernetes artifacts that we need to deploy them. Thirty gigabits a second. So the question was, when we say we can, Right. So the question was, how much traffic can we handle per container or per server? So, so we use network teaming on the individual nodes. Um, so per node, it's 20 gigabits a second. Um, and, and the bandwidth across a cluster is the width of all of the nodes that we have. So if we have 10 nodes um, at 20 gigabits a second per node, that would be 200 gigabits a second. Um, keeping in mind that, that that's uh, assuming many connected clients. Um, the most that one connected client could pull would be um, 10 gigabits a second. In that model. So the question was, what was the churn rate of this environment? Um, you know, I don't know. I think it's application dependent. Uh, we do deployments once a week, which churns every single pod in the node, um, or every single pod in the cluster. Um, but I believe that we also um, churn on the order of 50 to 100 pods per hour, uh, just generally. So the question was, what specifically in Kubernetes made this successful? Um, that's that's kind of tough to answer, but I but I really think it came down to the to the fact that your Kubernetes, um, the artifacts, the things that you push into the API are declarative and stateful. So it made it really easy to take a configuration that we had tested in the lab, and and deploy that um, into a production environment. Um, things like the the service load balancers and the extensibility of the API, the accessibility of data from the API were, were also uh, pretty crucial. So I believe the question was, it sounds like a successful project. Have you been successful at influencing the, the culture in Comcast outside of Viper? Um, I, I think that, um, you know, that's, that remains to be determined, but I think that that's the direction that we're heading. I've, I've seen a lot of interest from other teams throughout Comcast in, in what we've been doing, um, and, and people looking to mirror the success. All right, I think that's it. Oh, one more. All right, so the question was, how important is network security between microservices? Um, right now, not important. Um, but I think that as we, we look at uh, using Kubernetes in a more multi-tenant model, having many applications for many developers running in, in these clusters, that it becomes much more important. All right, thank you. Oh, one more. <laughs> So the question was, are we doing resource management to prevent one microservice taking away resources from another? Um, not presently. Um, but the resource quotas in, that you attach to a namespace um, are going to factor in heavily uh, in, in the near future.
All right, thank you.